So I want to get started by understanding the type of roles that you're uh, running searches for, just to give people a sense of uh, the types of roles as well as companies that you have working with. So maybe you can start with Sam. Thanks, and thanks for having us here tonight. So Riviera Partners only does engineering, product, and design. Uh, particularly, I specifically uh, focus on engineering. I'm an engineer by trade, uh, by training, a bad one. Uh, that's why I do recruiting now. <laughs> so VPE, CTO, CPO, Chief Design Officer. Proud uh, partner with Gusta. Mm -hmm. We're hired. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, so, I recently joined Lightspeed about a year ago, and before that I was at, uh, I was a competitor of Bill's here for a long time. Um, but now being on the venture side, we are recruiting for everything, so please email me. Um, but th the truth of that is, um, you know, we have 400 plus portfolio companies globally, and because of my background, I, I focus mostly sort of VP and up, um, up to board, and that's exact. But I think also the reality is that for a lot of the companies that we're investing in at, at Seed, at Series A, the exec is a senior manager. The exec team is a senior manager. It's a director, right? Um, and so we are looking across all functions and um, all backgrounds. So, um, and before that, I was, I was a general very similar to Bill. So I was going to say I'm very similar to her. Um, I work we at a firm called too. Divert. Yeah, exactly. Like, I work at a firm called Diversa Partners. I've been recruiting in tech for 26 years. Started when I was very, very young. Um, <laughs> five. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and I am a generalist. I work across uh, the entire executive suite at the VP level and above in general, up to the board level. Um, and our firm truly does a lot of executive searches in product, in engineering, in sales and marketing, and other revenue roles, in HR and in finance, up to CEO and up to the board. Um, so we truly touch it all, but it's executive and above. It's defining what an executive is is, is probably a little bit more gray, because um, that's a little different at a startup than it is at Google. So um, but a lot of breadth in what we do. This is exactly what I want to talk about. Um, you know, and Nicole, um, a lot of folks here are senior managers. Um, some of also are already executives. What's the difference between a senior manager and an executive? And how do you bridge that gap, or what can you leverage to go from that mid-level senior manager to an executive role? Um, and we can start with you, Bill. Sure. Um, so there's nuance to the question because the definition of that from one company to the next can vary. Um, if you're a senior manager at Google or Facebook, you're on the cusp. You would, could be an executive at a smaller company. Uh, if you're a senior manager at a 20-person startup, then you're probably not really a manager at all. So titles are one thing. <laughs> so titles are one thing, and like your your functional expertise or another. Um, you know, I think the way you bridge the gap uh, is one of two ways, if you want to think about it in simple for our use of time here. Um, you are a senior manager today, and you find a company that's willing to bet on you because of your expertise and your potential to hire you to step up. You're maybe at a bigger company, they take you to a smaller company and move you from senior manager to director. So you go down to go up, that's one way. Uh, the other way is you, are really diligent about committing to a company that develops talent internally. So you're, um, I have a friend who works at Facebook. She's been talking to me about, do I change, do I not? She's interviewing for a new job at Facebook. At Facebook, you don't have to leave the company to develop your career. It doesn't have to be Facebook, that could be Gusto. Um, once you hit a certain stage, talent development is very important. Startups, that's not a real thing. So, and this is not a startup anymore. Gusto doesn't qualify as a startup. It's a growth, uh, Nikhil's slide, it's a growth company. Startups, talent development isn't a real thing, it's luck uh, if it happens to you. Bigger companies develop talent and you have to try to chart a course where you think they'll invest in you to get to that next level. What are your thoughts, Nicole? I mean, I, I see there's senior manager to the executive and there's something similar that happens when you go from IC to senior manager, right? And it's the first time you're 
actually managing someone other than yourself. And a big difference in when you go from senior manager to executive is that um, you're, really, you're really moving into a leadership role. You're leading people. You're mentoring people. You are, um, you are teaching people. And you're, you're doing things that are less about your role and more for the people around you. And so the more that you can start doing that and um, helping other people around you, helping colleagues, helping teammates, like the more you're going to start developing those leadership skills, whether you have executive skills, whether you have it or not. And also, I think when you move into that executive role, um, you move from execution to vision and strategy as well. And so that's just, it's a shift in mindset. And you can start practicing that early. I mean, most people, when their ICs, have a vision for how a company can be, be doing something better or how a product can be better. Um, and starting to vocalize that and express that and starting to flex those muscles and not being shy, I mean, those are all tools that will help you um, become, move to that executive level. Got it. And you've mentioned the skills development part. I think one of the things that was brought up earlier is around like the network. Um, as a middle manager, like how do you develop that network um, in, in, with the hopes that one day can help you with those roles? Um, and do you want to go Sam? Sure. So I think you know Tony Shea from Zappos calls it collisions. You have interactions with people every day, and it also goes back to what Nick said about back channels. They're going to remember how you interface with them, not just what you did, but how it was to work with you. So how impactful you are, how much you cared about what matters to them, not just what you need to get done. So you're gonna make these connections just based on your everyday interactions on projects, whether someone asks you or you have to go ask them. All of those things are gonna matter. Yeah, so one of, you wanna, yes. So um, I think uh, salespeople are often really good at doing their own job search or advancing their career because the process of if you approach your career like you would try to sell your product, whatever it is, you build a, a target list, you proactively reach out, you're networking, you're always working your angle. So there's an inherent edge built in because your day job translates really well to the process of building a network and seeking out opportunities. And almost every other function doesn't naturally lend to that. And probably the least is maybe engineering, you know, in the day-to-day -day work that you do and in, in the nature of it. So I think Part of it is treating your career, no matter what your functional expertise is, treating your career in a like, proactive way. So there were some great points by all three, in all three lightning rounds about proactively managing, investing in your network, you know, not taking the recruiter calls. It, there's 500 different ways to do it, but it's about purposely uh, managing your career and building relationships and taking risks and asking for the meeting and asking for the mentor or whatever it might be, but you have to manage it. it if you're passive, the network never gets built. Um, so that's a really hard thing for a lot of people to do. It's not a natural skill. Yeah, totally. One of the points that was made earlier was around knowing yourself. Um, I think Nikhil made that point in terms of like what stages you like, um, and Nick also made that point. Um, you know, get your stuff together before you talk to the recruiter. Um, can you talk a little bit about how do you define your own style, how do you find your own narrative, and how important that is? Uh, maybe we can start with you, Nicole. Yeah, um, I found that, you know, this, this might sound a little cheesy, but if I think about it in, in three ways. Um, and it is, it's a combination of like, what do you genuinely enjoy doing the most? It might not actually be the job that you're in right now, but what do you really enjoy doing the most and reflecting on that? And then figuring out if um, that aligns with where you actually add the most value. And I actually think that this is really important because a, a lot of people are really good at any job that they do. And so you could be in a job where you're adding tremendous value, but you just don't like it. You're not like getting joy from it. Um, but maybe you're even getting promoted on that path and you're, because you're doing such a good job. But like really reflecting on, um, is it something that, you, that you're enjoying and that you love and that you're also um, adding a lot of value? And then 
like finding that and finding that about yourself will enable you to really articulate, okay, this is what I want to do and this is who I am and this is why. Like this is because my value system or whatever it is. And then in the next role that you look for, you're able to articulate that clearly. And then the third piece of it is you should be looking for something that you, a place where you can learn something new and grow. And so I, I think it's like the sort of the trifecta holy grail of best job ever is when you can when you can align those three things. I would also say think about why you like it or why you don't like it because in engineering it's first principles thinking or it's the five whys framework. You, you're told what to do and you have this path that people set out for you. You're often not going to end up on that path. So you have to figure out if you're going to go off that path, why is it? Because it's not always going to be clear which direction you should go in. And so ask people what you do best and you know, summarize that and also what they think you have the most opportunity to grow in summarize that you'll probably figure out sort of what you're good at and that changes what you're good at when you're 21 is not usually not what you're good at when you're 41 I hear at least <laughs> I'll let you know uh, so interviewing is a skill just like every other uh, functional skill that we all have and like anything else the more you practice it the better you get so if you think you want to be an executive that really is the least likely thing that's going to make you an executive just because you want to be one. You have to go out and practice the trade. Whatever level you're at, uh, interview often, right? Get feedback. Uh, there was some, one of the points was really good about asking for the feedback, um, which is critical. That's how you develop. Um, going on a lot of interviews, it's hard to talk about yourself. Nick uh, came up with a really concise way of talking about, like, here's my, my shtick. Here's how you would look at me in an a elevator pitch. Not everybody's good at that or, or knows it. That sometimes the best candidates for a job don't get the job because they're terrible interviewers and they're not great at telling their story. And these are executives. I had that happen this week. A um, outstanding executive interviewed for a job. He's got the perfect background. The client said he's got the perfect background. They just didn't click. Oh, by the way, that's a whole other part of this, which is the personal connection. Um, studying who you're meeting with, understanding a little bit about their corporate values. But the best candidate, arguably, did not do well. I happen to know this candidate. He's much easier to talk to the second, third, and fourth time you meet him. You don't always get that chance. So practice. Um, the best feedback I could give this person is, you know what? You're a little awkward. You need to find a way to like remove that in the first meeting because you would be getting this job right now. And this is somebody who's been a CEO. So we're talking about how do you climb the exact, this is a CEO who is a rock star, um, and he doesn't even interview that well. Yeah, I'm sure a number of people here are wondering at what point they get in touch with folks like you, in particular people who may not feel their execs. So how should you think about that decision, and how do you build a relationship with folks like you? Um, I think the the sooner the better. So like as soon as you think about it, start doing it. I, I guarantee you that if you ask three people that you work with, two out of those three will have probably two or three recommendations of recruiters that they've really enjoyed working with. So I would just ask, right? I can, you know, there's there's also, it's pretty, I mean, there's the, the, the best recruiting firms in the world. We're sitting with two of them. Um, you can just reach out to them. I mean, Recruiters actually really like when people reach out. And it's interesting because most of the time when you're reaching out, it's really rare when people reach out to us. And when they do, it's very welcome. I mean, two times, uh, today, it happened twice. I had um, this incredible woman, she's post MBA, and she reached out to me cold. And she's like, hey, um, you don't know me, I'm so and so, I really want to work at one of Lightspeed's portfolio companies fair, and here's why I think I should, I, I would be a great fit for their product role, even though I'm not a product manager. I'm like, okay, I sent it to the COO. It happened again with another guy. Like, it was incredible. So I would just say, just do it. Like, ask your friends and then reach out to people. And recruiters really like it. Well, the great thing is they're here, so. <laughs> <laughs> And for engineers in the room, one of the things that I found personally when I became at the manager level, when you're at the manager level, you will have to choose. Do you want to be an, a leader who is technical or a technical leader? So do you want to be a staff engineer? Do you want to go towards a CTO? What does CTO mean? Does it mean chief architect and visionary? Or does it mean people leader, right? So those questions you usually start to have to answer about yourself, at least in engineering, which is frankly the only 
when we've been recruiting in engineering. That is the level. Um, and so think about if you had 12 hours in a day, how many of those hours do you want to spend looking at architecture and very technical things? How many of those hours do you want to spend looking at business and more strategic things? And how many of those hours do you want to look at you know, dealing with recruiting and people management and all the messy stuff around people? And how you distribute those hours should give you a good, and that's at that manager level, should give you a good sense of which path you're probably most I would all just add one more thing. I think they covered most of it. Um, so if a recruiter does call you, always take the call. Unless this is somebody that seems wildly incompetent or unprofessional, take the call. Because you don't know when you'll need that person. Um, build the relationship. If you find out, um, I don't know which one of the three presenters said this, but you, know, you meet interesting people, oh, I think it was Flea, who know about their industry. Well, take five minutes, do a quick read. Does this person know what they're talking about? If somebody ever has an interesting job, even if you're not looking, but if they're working with a really good company, take their call. Because if they're working with that company, it's pretty rare. And we worked, we did some work with Gusto. Sam and I have tons of the same clients. Nicole and I used to compete on every search that we worked on. We all have good clients. It's rarely that a really shitty recruiter gets that one amazing search, but all their other ones suck. So take the one call if it's good, even if it's just, I'm not really looking, but let's meet because I want to know you for down the road. Also, I spoke to somebody today who used to work for Nick um, at Reddit. Somebody who um, is still on his way up in his career, but Nick asked me to call and Nick made the introduction. There's nothing more valuable than talking to somebody who, let's say you're here, you know somebody who's here, have that person make three or four introductions. Nikhil and I have done this many times together. Um, you need to meet this person. They're the future star, and I will take that meeting 100% of the time. Um, so again, like anything else, manage it work your network, take the calls, build a book, save every name, because you never know when you'll want to proactively reach out to them. And that matters a lot. If Nick or Nikhil send us an intro, that automatically means you're good. Because yep. they wouldn't be putting their name on the line for you if they didn't make that. So that matters a ton. That's another thing that I'd say, and we have more questions, but um, it's, it's never too early to start thinking about like who's going to be on your own personal board like who are going to be the people like nick and kill who you're going to have backing you right um and to start identifying those people that you really look up to maybe they're in your own company maybe they're not and start developing relations relationships with them um, early and they're people that you respect whatever like it because of industry or job and start really developing relationships with them and have a group of people that you start to curate those people will go to bat for you and like you just said if they introduce you to someone like that's gold and so the, the sooner you can be doing that not just to to like work their networks but you'll get a lot of mentorship and guidance from them too but I'd say I waited way too long to do that um, and I wish I did that a long 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 time ago and I would just say one more thing if you're talented and you have good skills it doesn't matter what level you are I have um, the call mentioned fair and we worked on the CFO search at fair this year and I know this woman very well I'd gotten her a prior job and her daughter is about to graduate uh, as an engineer she's entry level had done an internship at NerdWallet last summer. She's 22 years old. I met with her. I introduced her to four CEOs. Well, because I think female engineer coming out of college, looking for a job in San Francisco, there's a lot of companies that would want to hire that person. Right? It's a good time to be looking for a job. I don't place entry-level engineers, but I know a lot of heads of engineering. I know CEOs who would probably love to be able to move that person into their system. For all of us, networking is actually what we do professionally. It doesn't always come with the price tag. So it's not always that I'm only doing things that make me money. Even though at the end of the day, we're all capitalists, relationships are how I make my living. And that's not always like a direct correlation to pay me a dollar and I'll give you something. It's about paying it forward, um, feeding the network, helping each other out, making recommendations. Um, so if you're 27 and hoping to figure out how you could be an executive someday, even if I deal in CEOs, I still want to know you because there are people I know that would want to know you, and that's a benefit to me, even selfishly. So, yeah. And I'll add one personal story. Um, so the way I met Nikhil is actually through Austin, um, at BPR Partners, sort of an executive recruiter. And I was telling him, hey, you know, like, I'm looking for mentors. And I described the ideal mentor. And he's like, oh, I know exactly the person, Nikhil. And then he introduced me to Nikhil. Um, 
like a few months ago, and Nikhil has been like has had a tremendous impact already in the way I think about product, like teams, etc. Um, and that was through a recruiter. So I definitely encourage every one of you to really start building those, those relationships right now, even if it's not about finding your next job. It could be about finding an advisory role at a company. Whatever that is, like build those relationships. Yeah. So as you can see, this is a special audience, like underrepresented in tech. Um, I want to talk about the type of challenges that you've seen that people like us in particular are facing in those searches and any advice that you may have to help us overcome those challenges. Well, I think we, we've, we've almost answered what you can do about it, but I think some of it's fairly obvious. I think that um, even myself included, I think a lot of people of color are maybe first generation um, maybe second, but likely first generation in tech or in business. Maybe first generation to go to college and get your MBA. So you're not, you just don't have the network that's afforded to your peers who have parents who are in investment banking and CEOs of companies and went to all the Ivy League schools and can introduce you to all of the cool VCs and companies. Like it just does you don't have it. And um, I think it's just a huge disadvantage, which means all the more reason why you have to be so proactive and start developing your network right away, as soon as possible, and reaching out to as many people and making those connections because you're not, we're, like, we're not born with that. Um, so I think that's, that's huge, right? I think it's a big one. Um, I think that, you know, also, it just requires like a higher degree of resilience, I think, than people who are not of color, right? Every day there's, um, we face micro or not so micro aggressions, right? Um, there's racism, there's sexism, um, and it's on a daily basis. And it's, it's unfortunately the world and it's what other people don't realize and face and it's a real thing and that um, just requires more persistence more, um, more community around you, and and so I think having a really strong community around you, um, that's your own support group, but also making sure that you're developing relationships with communities that are not, and just like, just takes extra. <laughs> I think uh, Nick mentioned it's confidence, right? So confidence in being able to get the data about compensation. So underrepresented in engineering also includes women. When I work with female candidates, they often don't negotiate as much as they should. They also don't go and get the data. So they rely on us to have that data for them. But I, I was working with a candidate who he, he's, he, he consistently, we, we, we all have stories about this, right? Where a candidate will consistently come up short on interviews when they could have gone that extra mile and said, I can do this even though I haven't. And he didn't. And I said, this is the third time you've said this. I don't understand why you do this. And he said, look, I'm Cuban. I don't, I'm representing a community. And I don't want to make, I don't want to screw it up for them. I said, that's not easy for me to say. That's not your responsibility. So have that, it's tough and it's hard to have that confidence to go do it. But you're out there for you, not necessarily. Um, so in terms of the headwinds, the challenges are. So for a firm like mine, I think this would apply to Nicole's prior job uh, and Sam right now, when somebody hires our firm to do an executive search, they're looking us to hire an ex somebody who's already an executive and oftentimes somebody who's a more seasoned executive than the role requires because they want to hire you to step back into the job so that you will grow with the company. So therefore, you're choosing from a pool of seasoned executives. And if there's been inherent bias or uh, lack of African Americans in tech or however you look at women not getting the same advantages. So if the pool is an unfair playing field and that is who is being chosen from, then that's pretty fucked up. Excuse my language. Um, so that makes it really difficult. So then how do you solve for that? Right? I think there's a couple of things that, that can be done. And this doesn't apply to, to Flea right now and to Nick. They're made guys. They've already gotten the job. They are an executive. They also happen to be African American men, but they are executives in tech first. So therefore, they have. That's all that matters. They can get any job that that calls on those skills. So then, how do you you get past that? I think part of it is being really deliberate about where you choose to work. You can't just choose to go show up at a company. You 
we can't all just walk in here tomorrow and be Gusto employees, but you do get your, maybe Flea will uh, make it happen. <laughs> um, but what you can do is be really deliberate about the choices you make when you're given a choice. You can do your due diligence. Like Glassdoor is actually really valuable. Work your network of uh, other people in your community and figure out, you know, is this company really supportive, right? There's a lot of talk. Um, I think it was maybe Google this year that got a lot of heat for, you know, some inherent, oh, Facebook, no, it was Facebook that took a lot of heat this year, Nikhil. Um, <laughs> so, um, he just got, he he's going to fix it all. But I, I don't think that means Facebook is not a great place to work if you're um, a certain gender or, or skin color, but I think you really do need to be very careful about where you choose your job. That applies also to going to work for jerks and unethical people and everything else. But be deliberate about what choices you make and try to join companies that have a history of being supportive, being open, of really embracing diverse cultures. I have certain clients, um, and I think I was telling maybe Jules this before, a certain client that has, I've never heard this before. I, I'll, one more thought. So 80% of the searches we do right now have clients specifically asking for diverse slates of candidates. I've been doing this for 26 years. It's probably the last five years that that became a very real thing. In the last two years, a, a prominent at, at a level that, and, and some searches were only diverse candidates. That's a good thing, right? That, that's a great thing. Um, but most of those companies want Flea or Nick. They want the diverse candidate that's already there, right? I have a few companies that have started hearing about saying, I acknowledge there's inherent bias in this industry, that people of color have not had the same opportunities that an equally skilled white candidate may have had, and they are giving those people a chance to jump into a job that they may be slightly unqualified for by the letter of a job spec. Find those opportunities, find out who is taking those stances, but that's also about being proactive with your network. Don't just wait for somebody to come to you because you are of a certain gender or, or skin color. So I think, again, it still takes like going after it and getting it, but it is changing. And I've seen that because I've been in this industry for 26 years and I've asked to go find the people. So it feels like it's getting better, um, but I think I still obviously have a different set of lenses. So. And, and find the people who have your skill set because if someone asks Nikhil or Fleet or Nick who have that skill set and they say, you know what, I'm not interested, but you should really talk to this person, they'll trust that, frankly, more than they'll trust it from me unless they know me or I have pictures about them. <laughs> so, so do that first. So we'll often tell you, like, look, you should we'll wait. Let's wait for a few weeks. Do you know anyone who's going to be able to get you? What's the shortest path there? Does that person trust you, and do they have weight? And if they do, try that first. And if not, we can try to double team it. So that's sometimes how you can get it done. So I'd like to now open up for questions. How much time we have? Ten minutes. Um, yes. Hi, my name is Jamar. Uh, uh, you were talking about. Um, uh, not being afraid to negotiate, and so I wonder, uh, have you ever, has, has a, one of your, the folks that you've ever lost an opportunity to negotiate? I, I can't recall one that has lost an opportunity to negotiate, but I've often talked to people who are vastly underpaid once they found out the data. So the good thing about this market is it's fairly transparent. There's a preponderance of data. So I can't think of one that's been lost on negotiation, unless that person says, I want to take a job that I'm really not that qualified for, but I want to stretch myself, but oh yeah, I want to make the same. So that's a, that's a scenario maybe once or twice, but not, not often. Hi, my name's Lauren, product management. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, Well, someone else said this earlier, but you can't manage that. It's just going to happen. Um, so you have to know that it's going to happen, right? Um, the reality is that most people discount any reference you give by a lot. And they want to know, they want to get references from people that you did not give them. They're going to be good. I mean, and when they're not, then it's really bad. Like, <laughs> you give them, it's good happens a lot um, but uh, you, you can't manage it that's the thing and so um, 
what you can do is you can you can help people out a little bit and try and guide them. You know, like these are the people that I, you know, your references that you give should be like, you should give your best, right? Should be if, you, if it's appropriate, you're not currently there and you're afraid you're gonna lose your job. But, um, but you should give the 360, you should give those people. But I think the way, if you were to try and like manage it a little bit, try and guide them a little bit. Like here are other people that I've worked with because they'll start picking up on that. Like, here are other people that I worked with. Here's other people in other organizations that I collaborated with. Just try and, like, plant some names and seeds there a little bit because those will be the people that they end up probably calling. Um, but you just you just can't control it. It's going to happen. And um, do the obvious, which is prepare. If you're interviewing for a job, look on LinkedIn, see who you're connected with with that person. Um, if you know that you're connected with five people that you don't think really like you, right? Well, you might be screwed anyway, so that job might not be going to But let's say you see that there's a series of people that you know in common. Get to the three people that you know, that you know like you, that know them. Say, hey, I'm interviewing for this job. I saw you know so-and-so, Nick Caldwell. Would you mind like, just like dropping a note and saying, hey, I heard you're interviewing my friend. So you can't control who's making the back channel. What you can do is control the good information that comes out and not have it be in your provided reference, because I think Nicole's a thousand percent right. Provided references are borderline useless, or they're good for learning about how to work well with you, but the assumption is they're gonna be good references. So people use them for different things. Um, so control the narrative, and it's about preparation, right? And I think the, I'm amazed at the executive level, it's, it's epidemic of the lack of preparation that people put in for interviews. Um, and maybe it's because people are so busy and they're so senior that like, I'm just gonna show up, I got it. Well, that's fine, some of them pull it off. I, showing up for an interview having not used a product, having not looked at who's on the team, having not figured out who's like, you know in common, like that's just the basics. That's like the prep and the proactive stuff. And that's just being smart. So you can control that. As well, if you're going for a job, to Nikhil's point, if, if they're hiring you to bring them through hyperscale and you don't know people in common who have seen you do that, think about the people who have seen you do that and try to reach out to them. Like Bill said, prepare. You're gonna have to, you're gonna have to see the field with them. Yes? Um, when you're in product or engineering, how important is brush versus depth with between like what you've done in the past? Because, for example, I've worked in a lot of different industries but I feel like sometimes I can't level up because I don't have lots of experience in one particular what do you do best? Think about what it is you do best and how that's applicable to what you want to do next. So the, I usually tell candidates, think about your learn to leverage ratio. The job you take, there should be the numerator is what you're going to learn, what you're going to stretch yourself doing, like what you're going to gain from them. The leverage is what you bring to the table. So the denominator should be you know, what you can go and actually do and nail. And so the next job should be as close to one as possible to that ratio. If it's numerator heavy, they probably shouldn't hire you. If it's denominator heavy, you probably shouldn't take the job. So what do you do best in the denominator? How do you apply that to the numerator? Hi, my name is Alexis, and I work in the product So a couple of things. I think what people are looking for is some measure of success, um, first and foremost. If you, Nick might make fun of himself for being at Microsoft 15 years, it all worked out pretty well, right? So, um, and actually, that is a good way. Go to Microsoft or Google or Facebook and, and charting your course and getting up to a level where people are gonna call you for executive is a very safe, maybe a little uh, opportunity cost, but nothing wrong with the way that all worked out. So um, that's a good career. Uh, Nick might say I could have done this, that, or the other, but he's just being a baby. So, um, <laughs> so um, what people are looking for is a couple. Where were you successful? 
Now, if you've done startups, not everyone's going to be successful. You can get a pass, but if you've had a job every two years and all those companies stink, that's not a good plan. You're better off with the 12 years of Microsoft. So there's no one simple answer. Um, there was a point of don't stay when it's, don't be sedentary there. You're going down this, you have, this is a, we're opportunists in this industry. So you, one of the very hard things, even for Gusto, for Credit Karma, if there's a minute where it doesn't look like your company is gonna be the next rocket ship, people are out there thinking, well, I better get over to that other company that's a rocket ship. Opportunity, right? So um, it could be every two to three years. If you're a startup person, it could be 12 years. There's not one right answer. You need to show some really successful stints in those things. That's what people care more about. Yeah, I think that, um, I think, you know, it's maybe obvious, but you have a, like four year and a half stints in a row. Like, it's going to be concerning. Um, but I also think that what Bill said is exactly right. Like, people want to want to see how you were able to make a demonstrable impact in the business. And maybe if you're in a product role and you're at a company that like tests and iterates and builds and like does that, you can actually do a lot. But if you're you know, in a go-to-market sales role at a company that has really long sales cycles and you leave after a year and a half, like how much could you possibly have done? Like probably not much and you start to see that pattern. So I do think it's critical to um, to articulate head on why you made those moves um, and what you did that was high impact ahead of when people ask that question. Um, but you know, I think the diversity of experience is also really wonderful. So um, you know, having having a long stint somewhere like it definitely does give people comfort. Like oh wow, like you you can stick it out. Um, but I do think like just 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 that um, might make a startup a little uncomfortable that you aren't comfortable with ambiguity and you can't adjust, right? So. Uh, my name is Michael Hill, I in product and engineering at Google. Um, I had a question, we've been talking a lot about how we get into executives and things that are like headwinds. Um, how does education play into that? So like I have a master's degree in engineering and one thing I've always contemplated is like, Will getting an executive MBA kind of play into those opportunities when you're evaluating candidates? And getting so if you if you plan to stay in engineering, don't do it. <laughs> Honestly. So I. <laughs> so, yeah, okay. so, to, so to finish that, like I'm I'm currently like not in engineering per se. Like I'm I'm at senior manager level and, and on the product side, yeah. mostly like okay. you know, product operations and strategy for the most part. So. I would say figure out what the best real world experience you can get is. If you have to augment that with something else, do it. Two MBAs, they're neither of them are useful. And I think there are certain companies that really value that. There are certain MBAs and, and undergrad logos that some people really like and a lot of other people don't care. Um, you're at Google, so your experience at Google is, is, and that's an advantage for you. That's your master's degree, that's your MBA, and that's everything else. So if I was at Google, I wouldn't do that, even if it was on the weekends, like the Berkeley program you do on Saturday, I wouldn't do that. I don't think that's gonna move you any faster than doubling up what you're doing at Google and making it work there. Um, the, re I, ahead, the reason you get an MBA is number one, to switch functions, like you were up in sales, you wanna go to finance. Second is if you want to be, if you have a technical discipline and you want to manage that technical discipline, the third is to get contacts. You work at Google, you've got a lot of great contacts there. I'd spend the time rather than, as Bill said, rather than doing this on the weekends. Work your network at Google, it's probably I, I'm gonna counter this a little bit um, because there is still a big world that is really snooty. And um, they wanna see, like, they, like it, it, it's, it means something, it's currency, but, um, but I think it's, you, you can find other people that don't think that way, so you can get around it. I think that, um, especially here in the valley where we live, if you are a product, especially in product, if you're a product um, manager, and maybe, you know, maybe you're uh, an engineer too, we tend to see it more with product, but you like have these little dreams in your head every day about being a CEO, and you wanna found a company one day, then I would say, then, then going and getting your MBA, like that experience and that network will, will, will 
you could leap your into that experience from it. So I think it just depends. Someone said earlier, like, do you really want to stay in a technical role? You want to be a chief architect one day? Like, you don't need to go get any of that. Um, I would add that I see a lot of people with a lot of degrees, some people with no degrees. Um, there are only a couple of MBAs that matter to the people that care about that. So if you're not going to Stanford or Harvard or a few others, there's a large percentage of people that are like, uh, Kellogg, eh, that's fine. You know, not that. Hey. <laughs> 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 oh, damn it! I bet there's so many schools I could have mentioned at his school. But you know what I'm saying? Amazing, amazing school. Mark, like, you know, to Nicole's point, there are people, the small-minded people, who think, well, if you didn't have that, then you're not my person. That's really probably not the right job for that person anyway. So. Uh, I think that's actually shrinking um, for the large majority of the universe. And, and again, I think there's only a few schools that truly matter here in this in this industry. Um, and even that isn't that big a deal. Save your money. <laughs> uh, final question. Yes. Uh, hi, my name is Anthony. Uh, can I ask two questions? <laughs> okay, dude. Uh, so the first question is around <clears throat> how do you make sure you don't burn any bridges with recruiters given it's very competitive and you know like you're working with one guy next time you know, and then you want to maintain that over time uh, and then the second question is how do you um, you know like you, type, you can change jobs and move off if you're like let's say in engineering but you, why do you make that break into like a fast management job, do you do that internally and then you move? Or can you move into like, uh, can you please repeat So the first question I heard, um, sorry, can you, can you say it? I think the first question was how do you not burn bridges with recruiters and the yeah. second question was do you move up internally or externally, was that? Yeah. Okay, great. Never ghost a recruiter. <laughs> do it. I mean, I, like, it's okay if you don't respond to a recruiter, but I think the way that you burn a bridge with, with a recruiter is if you engage with them and they introduce you to a company and you ghost them. Maybe the company was horrific, but don't ghost the recruiter. They will never call you again, and they will tell everyone else. Um, so just don't, don't ghost us. <laughs> We're very sensitive people. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's like anything else. You treat people with respect, and you're, it's my. I'm working on my time. You've got a job. Oftentimes, when you're interviewing for another one, so we're all busy. It's all hectic. Just be respectful. Communicate well. You don't have to take the job. I am. I've had as many searches I've worked on. I've had way more offers turned down. Uh, and the only time that I end up really like disrespecting somebody is when I feel like I was disrespected and lied to or not treated uh, like an adult. So. It's business, you're, you're a free will, you just have to be decent with how you deal with people. Yeah, That's just all. be honest. You don't even have to reply. It's okay not to reply. You don't have to take every call. I think you should engage. But if you are engaged, be respectful. And then on the second question, I tend to see internally as a way to leverage what your social capital is with inter inside the company. If you say, hey, I'd like to take on this you know, new project, I want to do this in my career. They know you, they know who you are, and there's a little bit of a safety net there. And Bill, to Bill's earlier point, it's gonna be a lot riskier to take a job to that numerator heavy, you know, uh, opportunity, <laughs> for them to actually, first of all, let you get the job, and second of all, to trust you to, to succeed in it. So if you can go internally, do. But if you just find yourself stuck, then maybe you should go elsewhere. Awesome, thank you so much, Bill, Nicole, and Sam. This was really, really helpful.